I'm Chris Farnham. I'm a senior uh, user experience designer at ProQuest, AKA Information Architect. And this is uh, Serena Rosenhan, also um, uh, our department head from, um, of the investigation team at ProQuest. Um, so manages a team of uh, other information architects, user experience designers. So um, three or four years ago, ProQuest um, had this uh, really, really big project that we needed to do to um, bring a bunch of legacy platforms onto a single search platform for searching um, magazines, scholarly journals, newspapers, across um, uh, all kinds of academic products into one platform. And then later, we've been um, taking this platform that we've been building and um, adding other kinds of databases, including uh, dialogue business-oriented databases to them as well. So at the beginning of this project, um, the idea was that we wanted to find a new way to work, um, to move out of the agile mindset, uh, move out of the, sorry, the waterfall mindset into the agile mindset. And so we had to do the, a lot of mental shifts. And uh, we wanted to um, tell you today about uh, what were some of the key takeaways we had from um, making this journey from waterfall to agile and sharing some of those tips and tricks with you. So um, a show of hands, uh, how many of you are working in an Agile methodology right now? Okay, so maybe half. How many of you expect to be working in an Agile methodology sometime this year? It's really spreading like wildfire and uh, lots of um, development organizations are switching to Agile techniques to try to drive development and to um, quicken the pace of development. And um, as information architects, we need to figure out how to fit into this culture and mindset. Um, so a little bit more about our background. I've probably covered most of this, but um, we uh, really um, wanted to try to find a way to uh, quicken the pace of our development, knowing that we have teams on multiple continents so every day I have um, dailies that involve conference calls with people in the UK, sometimes India, um, sometimes the West Coast. So we needed to bring these teams together. We needed to um, put all kinds of process and framework in place um, to get Agile working at ProQuest. I want to hand off to Serena who can tell us a little bit more about um, some of these transitions we made. Well, um, it was kind of hinted at in the last slide, but at ProQuest, I would describe the role of the user experience designer is generally to translate our business requirements into user experiences. Um, and we document these designs so that development can implement them and, and put those experiences into a live um, working software. So we came from a pretty well-oiled machine from the development uh, perspective, and this is the way we used to work. We would um, do things in a very orderly process, and the, um, in the traditional method of our waterfall development, we would take time in an upfront design stage to think through all of the implications, design the information architecture, the labeling systems, the site structure, and all those things. We would spend time interacting with the developers. We would have joint application development um, sessions, and we would do our user testing at this point. Um, those core IA activities that are probably familiar to most of you. So this is, it would happen here. We would hand over our deliverables, and the development team would go away, and sometimes we'd feel a little bit bad because they wouldn't come and ask us questions. Um, but it would get tested, and it would get delivered. So when we began to switch to Agile, this picture changed. Before I show you the new picture, I just want us to get on the same page about Agile, um, what we mean by it, what we're thinking of in our minds. And I found a very useful and suitable definition um, from Wikipedia. So it's software development methodologies, and at, at its core is iterative and incremental development. Um, so for example, in our organization, we do builds of the software every single day. There's a daily build. Whatever code got written that day gets pushed out. 
and everybody can look at it and see it and see what see what's happening with it and then every two weeks we do a build of the comprehensive functionality into a different environment we call stable environment and we do some different activities with that code and then every depending on what we've decided five six of those releases we'll do a full customer and user release so it's working in this way where there's these very frequent releases um, What's happening in Agile is requirements and solutions are to evolve through collaboration. And because you are working in this pace of very frequent delivery, um, the planning has to be adaptive and evolutionary. And you're also, though, sticking to your timetables. If you're not ready, you don't push off the release. You, those, those releases are very um, reliably they occur on very specific predetermined timetables. So as we began to talk with our development team and figure out what was going to happen, um, we began to ask, um, so this is kind of what things started to look like. And we began to ask, where does the information architecture fit in? So we've got, our, we've got some planning. It'll go in. We'll prioritize some things. The design will start to work. The development will start almost right away. We'll do an iterative release. We'll follow this cycle a few times and then release out to the customer. Um, so if development is happening at this pace and this frequency and this early, where does information architecture, architecture occur? Um, now in our organization, we found that the role that was asked of us in Agile was still the same thing. It was still to translate those business requirements and into a user experience and to put some definition for the developers in place. Um, so we still perform a lot of our core IA processes um, within a design phase. It's just a lot shorter and a lot more frequent. Um, so you have to change a little bit about how you work when this is the case. So as we began to um, participate and experience this new agile uh, rhythm of working, um, it wasn't always comfortable. And as we started to try to reflect on why, where was the discomfort coming from, um, what wasn't easy, um, it wasn't just that we didn't want to change. There are certainly things we wanted to change about the way we used to work. But these are some of the things that we were comfortable with and that we um, really found were our value proposition as information architects in a waterfall development methodology. We get to define the systems, the navigation, the labeling, everything. We create this comprehensive, scalable user experience. If you can do that, you've done your job as an information architect, right? And that's, that's kind of how we were used to thinking. We spend that time, we get the research in place to inform those designs. We provide our detailed and elegant deliverables to our developers so that they have all their questions answered. Um, and of course, this saves the organization money because the development team is only coding things once right the first time and we, we get to a happy, perfect experience in the end. And, and, and this should sound familiar to a lot of you. This is the business case. This is the argument for creating our, many of our departments within our companies. Well, enter Agile and what happens to these values? We can't define everything up front. We don't know all the requirements up front. You cannot do all your user research up front. Things are not firm enough, they're not in place, and there really isn't time. It's very, that's one of the most challenging parts about Agile is getting that user research in. You can't create beautiful, detailed deliverables. There just isn't time. You have to make them smaller. You have to produce them much more frequently. And coding begins before the design is finished, so where's the money saving? Um, inevitably, the code's going to have to be rewritten because you're still in the process of designing it. Um, so this, is, this required us to rethink uh, what the criteria for success was and what our contributions as information architects are in this new way of working. Um, and we found that in order to do this, we had to let go of some of our old ideas of what we call perfection, the sort of the ideal state of how we'd like to work and the, the ideal way we'd like to deliver our work. And we had to do some changing, changing how we think and changing how we work. So I'll admit that we did spend a little bit of time um, kind of lamenting what we had lost in our old working relationship in, in our traditional 
waterfall. So one of the mental shifts that we had to make, and this may sound familiar to a lot of you, um, we had to sort of try to look on the bright side. We needed to start understanding the opportunities for information architecture in an agile working uh, environment. So certainly it's an opportunity to design iteratively. We don't have to know all the answers right now. We can work those out as we go, as we get smarter, as we learn more. Um, that can really be freeing as a designer. Um, not only does it take a little bit of pressure off, but it actually gives you freedom to make mistakes faster. Wouldn't we rather make our mistakes early so we can correct them than very, very late in the game when it's much too late? Um, and of course, another advantage, we have really capitalized on this advantage, is because of those daily and bi-weekly builds, you've got something that functions much sooner than we ever had it before, and we can see it. We can put people in front of it, and we can, we can interact with it. And those working prototypes are a huge opportunity for information architects. Um, and another shift that we had to make, and everybody in our team really had to make, is it's okay to refactor, to redesign, to change. It's okay, think of the artist who makes many sketches, crumples up paper, and throws them away. We had to kind of shift into that mindset that some of the stuff that we put out there and some of the code that was built is really literally going to, not literally, figuratively going to be crumpled up and thrown away as we work toward getting the right thing. Another thing um, we had to change because we're no longer expected to provide sort of the entire picture of the design up front, um, some of that's uncomfortable. We really like to understand sort of the known universe when we organize it. It's kind of hard to create a site map for something that you don't know is going to exist. So that can be a negative to, to Agile, but there's a positive side to this. Um, it's, you can actually gain some efficiency when you work in, um, more incrementally. So you have to focus in on what you need to have, not just what you want to have. Um, you need to get, the, get to the basics and get to the core. And when you can do that, when you, when you kind of train yourself to start thinking about what's essential to the experience and build that first and design that first, you begin to gain efficiencies in your design. Um, ways we do that, we really found personas and use cases to be critical here. Um, we obviously would take into consideration the priorities of the business. Um, sometimes the factor is the, the development lead time needed. Maybe that's the piece you've got to put in place first because of the, the, um, the time needed there. Or the complexity um, of the, the development or the things that were just most important to the business. Um, and also, another thing we had to get used to is that sometimes the want to have, or the, I mean, the, excuse me, the need to have can be a moving target. As business, need change, business needs change, as reactions change, sometimes things become more essential that were not thought essential. And you can react to that when you're working agilely. Another mind shift that we've had to make is um, we've let go of delivering perfection up front, but we can increment our way to perfection. So one way to do that is to leave a lot off the table. Think just enough, just in time. Um, you know, complexity can sometimes be our enemy. And when you are forced to work in an agile environment, you get some tools and some help combating that. Um, it's best to start simple, to test, and iterate as needed. Um, so we no longer try to design the ultimate end state up front. So these uh, mental shifts, um, changing how you think, I'd like to take that uh, a little bit more into changing how you work and put these principles into practice and to especially start with that um, thought about prioritizing requirements and getting that right so that it fits the development cycle. Um, this uh, story of the pyramid in Agile has been around for a while, since at least 2001. Um, there's a good article by John Mayo Smith, Two Ways to Build a Pyramid that appeared in Information Week, and uh, I'll summarize it for you. So the idea is that the um, 
a pharaoh wanted to build a pyramid. He wanted it to be the largest possible, and he appointed a builder to get that project moving. And uh, he wants to have the tallest one um, he possibly can, um, and he wants it before he's dead. So builder number one took this approach of um, we're going to build a really big foundation. We're going to build the biggest possible foundation we can because it's got to be the biggest possible pyramid. So they built a first layer, and they built another, and they built another building up vertically. Well, anybody imagine what maybe happened there? He died. He died. He died before the pyramid was finished. This is no pyramid. It's some kind of trapezoid or something like that. Um, the project didn't reach a completed state. So approach number two, which builder number two uh, took, um, the pharaoh was smart enough to have uh, builder number one and builder number two, two projects going simultaneously. So um, builder number two built a smaller pyramid. Well, before the pharaoh was dead, there was an actual pyramid. He had reached a point in the development phase where there was a complete fully functioning system. So you can build onto a pyramid like this. You just have to think a little bit differently. You have a fully functioning system and you can add to it in increments. So let's take that idea and translate it into um, a hypothetical project, maybe one that's a little bit close to something we've been through maybe. Um, so the general requirement is that you've got this uh, big collection of articles. Users have to be able to um, find things and then save them and organize them into their own personal account space. And so um, the business has been working on requirements for this and um, you've been collaborating with them and so we have this sort of level of business requirements. So people have to be able to save articles, they have to be able to email them to themselves and to uh, colleagues. They um, need to be able to uh, find the things that they've saved already in the past. They need to um, allow, uh, we need to allow users to take notes around these articles and save those. And, um, oh, by the way, we've got this personal account space. We uh, need to let users create that, right? They need to sign up for an account and stuff. So there's actually a lot of functionality here behind this requirement. So you can imagine that um, you're whiteboarding and brainstorming about all the things that need to go into the user experience and a bunch of uh, things might wind up on your whiteboard. You know, oh, we want people to be able to not just save articles, but put them in folders. And we want, uh, oh, we want ratings. Ratings is really important because that's hot. We, we need people to be able to rate articles because then we'll be able to do better searching around it and, recommend it and recommendations. That's cool, right? Um, and uh, we want to, uh, let's see, have people, oh yeah, they're creating accounts, we need to have them change passwords. And so all these things wind up on your whiteboard. And um, like a good affinity diagrammer, you know, one of the jobs an information architect plays is to organize this stuff into some meaningful uh, groupings so that you can think about them and take them off and develop them. Um, so let's go back to the idea of the pyramid as sort of an organizing principle for our affinity diagram. You have this basic level layer of basic functionality, the things that you need to have a complete working system from the standpoint of your business requirements. Next level up is enhancements, and after that, embellishments. So can we put these, uh, brain, this brainstorm we've had into this framework? Well, you can. So for example, in um, this first area here of the ability to save articles, you know, first thing we need for basic functionality is the add delete functionality there. People need to be able to put things into a list. And then uh, one up from that might be this folders idea I mentioned before. And then later on, um, after you've gotten things there, you might also need renaming and moving things around and adding notes and that kind of thing. And so on down the line, you, we've arranged things into, you know, sort of like the most essential to life of the feature um, we put things into these rows. So when I first started to describe this, I went up the column, and there's a danger there. 
you might be thinking in terms of, oh, I need to build upward along these features and um, wait, I want this to be a perfect experience. So I want this feature to be complete. I really want people to be able to do this editing and moving and renaming in the first pass. Well, to get that working system going, to get that um, initial pyramid built, you might have to let that stuff go until a later sprint, a, a later development cycle. Um, it's a lot more um, conducive to the Agile process if you build a first layer, if you get an initial baseline going and then add to it from there. So that bit I've just talked about is really about prioritizing requirements. So another thing that information architects do is we go and sketch and we wireframe and so on. And when we do that, all kinds of interesting things happen and we put all kinds of cool stuff on the page. And um, when we get to that level of granularity of building out a basic feature, you still have to apply these ideas of simplest thing first, the simplest thing that could work as, as Serena was saying earlier. So um, let's look at this. So we have this first bit of functionality we're gonna focus on, which is just you know, having this list of things you've added, things you've added to a list and then being able to delete something. Well, this is my very simple wireframe for that. It's got a page title, it tells us how many items are on it, that's maybe a little bit of frosting, but um, we have the article with a way to get to the article and a delete button. And that might be the very first thing in sprint one of development that you need to get your engineering team to do. Now, think of all the things that your engineering team has to set up in order just to make this happen. It's a lot of stuff. And it seems very simple, it's like, oh, this is, this blindingly simple wireframe, it's driving me nuts because I want to put all kinds of other things on it. Well, in order to write the requirements, you have to be thinking about the long-term vision and maybe you have another wireframe that's got all that other stuff on it. But what you do when you write re requirements and you put them into user stories in Agile is you need to pare it down and hand off to the development team these basic levels first. When you get to your second layer, maybe you're ready for sprint two, then you can start to add more things on top of this initial wireframe. So um, maybe we have a link back to results. We have a way to sort the list to make it a little bit easier for the user to find what they were, look, you know, find the things that they put there before. We might add additional metadata details to the um, articles themselves. These are all things I would have wanted in my first wireframe, you know, just do this. You know, when I was doing a waterfall, the, idea in waterfall is that, you know, boy, if I don't get it into that design and people don't see it documented, it's just not going to happen. Well, Agile frees us from that. It allows us to build incrementally. So now we've been trying to tell you about the advantages and um, the uh, positive sides of Agile, but it isn't without challenge, and there, there are, it's not without tension. Um, when you start to design incrementally, it can be very easy to get bogged down in those details. You're designing just very little bits at a time, and it can be a challenge to keep the focus on the big picture. Um, so I found that we really have had to develop a new ability, and I called it bifocal design. Um, we need to be able to pay attention to framework, to architecture, to big picture, to things we've heard are coming. But we also have to be able to deliver, so that's sort of my site map to represent that. But we also have to be able to focus and deliver very specific detailed features. Something as simple as turn the highlighting on or off on this page. Um, and this can be um, a little disorienting at times. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves to come back up to the big picture. And what we found is often we'll sort of get through a push of, of work and enough things will have changed that we'll say, you know, we need to step back. We need to take a look at this area and refactor it and look at it again. Um, and, and we don't, we, we have to speak up as the information architect when that occurs. The development team's not gonna plan that into your calendar for you is one thing we found. Um, another bit, um, a big part of what we do as information architects is the, the artifacts that we make. Um, so that has to change a little bit too. We need to change how we use and approach deliverables when we're working in an agile environment. 
Um, so many of the deliverables that we need are the same as we would have used in, an, in a waterfall fall, um, approach. Um, the difference really is in the way you produce and use these deliverables. Um, Anders Ramsey um, talks about how one of the big shifts that user experience designers need to make is we shouldn't think of our um, deliverables as the end goal. And we probably don't realize that we do that, but we very often, you know, I've handed over my spec, I'm done, what's the next project? Um, deliverables are not the end goal now. The working software is. Deliverables just document the decisions that have been made as part of the conversation with the rest of the team. Um, so they, may be, they, they play a little bit of a different role in our, in our work. We've got to think lightweight now because we're moving so quickly about deliverables. Um, the Agile Manifesto, one of its tenets is working software over comprehensive documentation. I mean, if things stay on paper and never get built, what's the value? All of our beautiful work just stays on paper. Um, on another hand, there, um, we can go a little bit too far with that, in the interpretation of that. We had conversations at ProQuest to say, so we're not going to write specs anymore. We're not going to do any documentation. I mean, we really had those conversations. Um, Austin Gabella reminds us there's a dangerous anti-deliverable meme lurking about. And, and that's not um, going to help your team. You're moving so quickly. You do, we have found, we, we absolutely do need documentation. We do need some definition. Things are going to iterate. You might touch something one month, and then you might touch it again in two months or six months. And I don't know about you, but I can't retain all that in my mind. Um, so finally, again, Anders Ramsey um, notes that UX designers continue, continue to struggle with letting go of the deliverables mentality. And we have this idea of our job being creating pretty looking design artifacts before starting to create the software. Um, and we have to let go of that attachment to, to beautiful, beautiful looking deliverables. In fact, um, some have suggested, why don't we just, we, you do the simplest thing that could possibly work in your deliverables. So dirty deliverables for some situations. Here's a basic site map, sticky notes on butcher paper. Um, it, does the team understand what the organization is? If that's enough, that's enough. Uh, and it, one thing that's nice about this is when it's agile, you can move things around. It, it kind of reminds people that things aren't um, final. It can be iterated, it can be changed. We really found that we had to strike a balance in our documentation. Um, so we've streamlined and moved to doing very basic annotated wireframes. Um, we've just simplified them and we, we draw the, the wireframes to supplement the written out user stories. Um, they provide a little bit more detail. They give you a visual and um, we deliver often incomplete wireframes as Chris was modeling. You wouldn't put all the detail on your drawing. You'd put just really what's going to be built in that sprint or that um, pass and you're going to revise and do this. Um, over and over again. Uh, Chris mentioned user stories. That's the, the general um, replacement for our spec is a small list, a, a small story about what a user needs to do. Um, it usually includes a statement. For example, as a researcher, I want to see a list of articles I've selected during my session. Um, it, it includes some criteria for how this uh, user's needs will be met. And we've got some examples here. And um, then we also find that we, it's good to document, to link out to things that are more detailed like wireframes and then to document things like who wrote this thing in the first place and who do I go to for questions. Because again, the deliverables are a documentation of the conversations that are taking place and the decisions. Um, So in conclusion, to wrap up our uh, Agile talk about Agile, <laughs> um, I want to come back to this idea of perfection and do you really have to let go of perfection to be Agile? And I think probably most of us in our hearts are perfectionists and so the answer is probably no. But it's important to remember it's not about perfect deliverables, it's about working toward a highly usable product. So perfection 
is something that you have to let go of as being a goal. It's, or it needs to be a goal, not an end state, is what I mean to say. Um, so you're never going to reach absolute perfection in your design. So you can always improve upon a working system and things change, let's face it. Um, you know, new technologies arrive and so on and the site you made yesterday is gonna need improving tomorrow. So um, think of perfection as an opportunity to get closer and closer and closer to it. You never reach infinity, you just approach it. So these are lessons we're still learning and uh, we imagine that you are or will be soon too. Um, and we'd like to invite you to ask us questions and um, also to find this presentation on SlideShare. This is a link to my SlideShare account. It's also on the Lanyard account for uh, the conference as well. Questions about Agile? Well, so um, what we try to do with user research is to um, make, we have a big enough team where we're able to plan ahead a little bit for some user research. We're also able to um, take stock of what we've built recently and periodically do user research on that. Serena, do you want to cover a little bit more on that? I think yes, it will. It, it sort of depends on what your current bag of tricks is, but um, you have to be agile in your research as well. So again, you have to have that focus. You have to ask yourself, what do I really need to learn? You know, how do I be efficient? How can I turn around the, uh, the findings and the interpretations quickly? Um, so the answer is yes, but probably not as drastically as you think. Do you have a specific thing in mind? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think you have to forego any of them. You have to choose. You, you have to, to pick the one that's going to bring you the most value for what you need to accomplish in the near term. Um, we are getting to a point, um, again, we have a very large complex system, multi-year development project. We're in-house. We, we live with this. So we have a little bit of flexibility in that we um, we're getting to a point where we are just sort of scheduling regular tests. We will do a test this frequently. And as we approach that test, we figure out what do we need to do? What, what does that test need to tell us? And we design it. We've um, been successful at that because we've tried to streamline our recruiting and make it as quick to ramp up as possible. We use remote testing um, and we try to have a bank so that we can really get a test together within a few weeks if we need to. We've also been um, adding sort of more informal touch points, but on a short, short and regular basis to our development cycle to getting feedback from customers on things that we've designed but yet haven't yet made it to production to get immediate feedback on hot button issues. So working with a few key customers, um, again, that idea of it's not going to be statistically significant, this information that we collect, but we're going to get um, some you know, high value anecdotal um, responses from uh, sort of uh, users that we think are uh, our target, you know, that are, are the right target audience for us. Yeah, I saw a question. Yes. Right, so one of the things to keep in mind is that we are um, an internal part of the team at ProQuest. So working agile when you're an Audi, when you're working with an agency or an external firm, can be a lot different. So um, you have to make some decisions when you um, go into an engagement like that about how much you want to be involved in the agile development cycle. So there's quite a spectrum there. Um, one of the things that um, typically happens in Agile now is that there's a sprint zero where a lot of planning takes place and stuff that happens before the major development begins. And it really is the job of the business and also of the team to get objectives right before some of that coding begins. You have to have some idea where you're going and have a little bit of a roadmap. So as an external agency, you could be really effective doing 
that kind of assistance. And it's a little more waterfall from your perspective as the outsider, but um, it can be really valuable to the business as well. But then the other side of the spectrum, uh, you could be involved at the point where you're creating these just-in-time deliverables and getting them into the uh, sprint cycle so that you're writing user stories, um, hopefully um, one sprint ahead before the um, development begins on that functionality. So as information is being coded by developers and you're giving feedback on that process, you're also looking forward to the next sprint, designing things that are going to be picked up the next time they do estimation. Um, estimation is one of the regular things that happens at the beginning of a sprint. The team looks at the wireframes and the user stories and says, we think it's going to take about this much effort um, in order to uh, code this functionality. Does it fit within our sprint cycle? And I was just going to also mention, there's pro there might be some people from Menlo here. If Anybody from Menlo? No? Um, if any of you know anyone from Menlo, they regularly do uh, agile consulting with their their clients and they would have be a good resource for that. Yeah. Yes. Good question. Did you have any? Uh, I'll take a stab. I guess. Junkies. <laughs> um, I don't know. That we had documentation junkies. I think we were all happy when we didn't have to write those sixty to hundred page specs any longer. But again, it was when you then realize, well, how do I influence and how do I contribute? Um, and, and we had to sort of revision what that was going to look like and reassure ourselves that we still would influence and contribute. Um, I guess to speak to your question. My approach usually is to try to get up a level at need. What are the needs that we're meeting here um, by what we're delivering, by how we're interacting with the other parts of the organization? What do they need from us? And you know, if your development group isn't really going to work agilely, if there's not the demand for that, then that you're probably not going to have a lot of success in trying to convert your team to, you know, to agile. But if, if there is a demand, but you're having people, and, and we went through this in, in a lot. I think every single one of us went through this to a certain degree. Um, we just didn't want to let go of those papers. We just didn't want to hand them over because we hadn't thought through them. We were used to having so much more time to think through things. And um, we really had to work with ourselves to put stuff out there. It was OK if it was a little less than fully baked and move forward. And I think you have to go through that a few times and have some reassurance that you're going to be able to get back to it. So I think that's the, 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 the theory that you have is that you'll never be able to finish that thing that you have in your head. Um, maybe others have suggestions for, for you in that experience. So one suggestion is to have a good system for keeping track of the wireframes and user stories that you have created. One of the key uh, consumers of that system will probably be your QA group and they need to do things like write test scripts and make sure that they understand the functionality and that it's tested you know so that there there aren't functional problems with the code and uh, they very much depend on the existence of, um, of of proper documentation well it's still proper documentation it just comes out in smaller chunks and sometimes quite often it overwrites each other so you have to you know, include notes to previous wireframes, previous specs, and so on in the stories that you're writing. So um, as you're writing new things and they overwrite old things, it might be good to refer back to that. I think, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a very good point, and I think that, yes, there is that danger. Um, and I think there's you know, business decisions that have to be made about whether your releases are just internal, and you get that up to a point where it's, the customers will accept it and understand where you're coming from. You know, um, we've had to do a lot of 
communicating and setting expectations in the marketplace about how this is really going to be okay in the end um, and giving them enough upfront that that's core and valuable um, and that is really the, that is really the trick to do agile well you're delivering value to the end user every time you put something out there and and it needs to be something that they perceive as value so that's a very real ongoing challenge I think for agile teams Lou Rosenfeld is not a big fan of redesigns. You've probably heard him mention that, you know, redesigns are evil and we shouldn't do them and so on. And one of the things about Agile that um, helps to embrace that mindset is that if you have a team that's constantly sort of iterating on an existing design and refactoring that design and changing the underlying code as it's needed to modernize it, to make it more efficient and so on, then you really don't have a need to do a complete redesign or re-architecture as often as you um, would in the case where you do something waterfall, it sits out there in maintenance mode for a few years and then, oh wait, we have to redesign the whole thing. If you can get out of that cycle and onto one where you're doing a continual investment in a logical way with development and design and agile, then maybe you get away from those times when people are saying, wait, you know, legacy functionality, how do we fill it all in? Um, that, that's a very hard thing. It's something that we had to face as we migrated off le legacy platforms. Hopefully it'll be a really long time before we have to do that again. Well, so um, I'm sort of thinking back to, you know, I actually, in my first day um, rejoining ProQuest was at Menlo, um, getting their training. And I do recommend that for anyone who gets a chance to um, go to Menlo and experience their brand of Agile. It's not everybody's brand of Agile, and it's not our brand of Agile, but it's good to see it in action. Um, so, uh, Let's see. I would say that you're, you, you do have to implement in a situation where a client's going to be open to it. They do have to be involved and be willing to give you feedback, to give you input. And if they're not, maybe Agile's not a good fit. Um, you can make that decision too. But um, the value, the thing that you can sell it to them with, is this idea of you're going to get to see into our process more often. We're going to ask your opinion and you're going to get to see some working code and give us comments on it. That gives them more surety that they're going to get what they want at the end. And um, hopefully it'll develop more trust and relationship with that client over time. I think that's probably the main way I would try to get you to um, convince them of the value of the process. Yeah, we even have that happen internally now. We will put something in the stable environment and our business sponsors will look at it and they'll say, well, yeah, but the customers also really said what they meant by that thing that you interpreted one way was, was really this. And we have a chance, if we're not too far to the end of our release, to change that the next sprint. So there's a lot of value to be had with that, in, that input, that looking at that working software. There's a difference between um, releasing internal releases that you show that prototype to the customer before you show it to the end user. So, you know, get them comfortable with what they're seeing before you release it to the outside world.
Well, so that that is that is a serious problem, and it's one that we've experienced definitely. Um, the idea of this, you know, legacy functionality and customer support taking calls. You know, where is this favorite feature that I had? Why has it changed? And so on. So I would say that um, one of the ways to deal with this problem, which maybe doesn't have a magic cure to it, but a lot of it's through communication and marketing about your product, getting customers, key customers involved in seeing what your new system is looking like, um, and uh, sort of managing customers and your organization, including your customer support through the process. Um, we've fallen victim to this too, that sometimes, you know, in developing the product, we need to step back and then get um, our uh, customer support on board with the changes that we're making and get them to understand the rationale so that they can communicate it on the front lines to those customers who call up. It, it, again, not a magic cure, but communication throughout your organization about what the development team is doing helps a lot. I just wanted to add, because you it sounded to me like your QA team has a certain script that they're following, and they're almost testing the new system against the legacy requirements. And um, we have had to use the approach that the QA team tests that, that iteration's requirements, they are constantly iterating their scripts. They are constantly iterating their test scripts. Um, I think that's an area where, I th where we, would, we certainly need to learn more, I think, at ProQuest on how to be more efficient with our testing. But um, you can't, if it isn't supposed to be built yet, it's not a bug. <laughs> you know? So I think you have to work some of those logistics out and, uh, in, a, in a similar way that we had to figure out where we fit, where the IA fits. I think we, the other group that had to do a lot similar, a similar process was our QA team. How, how does QA fit in here now if everything's always shifting under your feet? What, how do we, what's our value and, and how do we do our job the right way? And I think we've, you know, we've tried a lot of different things, it's a lot of experimentation, but our QA, one of the things we do is when we send the, when we write a new user story, we have a QA member on our team and we actually have to send the story to the tech lead and the QA team to review it. And the QA person has to say, it makes sense, I understand it. And when that story goes into Sprint, QA is looking at all those stories and saying, our test